This was version one of my 100% 3D printed ukulele project, and now I'm working on version number two. I have successfully printed the front face of the new ukulele. This is called the soundboard in instrument making, and you can see I've reinforced that face with an ISO grid, isometric infill or triangular infill, depending on your slice or whatever it's named. And by using the infill pattern, instead of drawing this in the geometry itself, every one of these lines is a continuous strand of filament being laid down, and that adds fantastic strength. So this is fully rigid enough and you can hear it still resonates quite nicely. So that makes for a great soundboard with a built-in attachment for the strings at the bridge end. I had a bit more of a struggle with the back portion of the ukulele. This was the first print and there was a power loss right here. You can see the print resume on power loss function did not work very well because the machine was not able to rehome itself when it tried to pick up the print. And that's what it resulted. It was printing too close to the previous layer and so it was just absolutely terrible. This was not gonna be a viable print, especially when I need everything to be really perfect for the ukulele to work well. This is a functional print after all. The second print started to print the walls. It was doing okay, but it had peeled up. Yeah, you can see the ugliness that was happening right here once it peeled up and it was just, it wasn't printing correctly. So I added some mouse ears and got a successful print on this back geometry. Looking in here, I don't know if this happened after the bed cooled, cause you know, it was a heated bed, but you can see the separation there, the discoloration, and it happened on both of these ears. So you can see the nice dark color right here and then closer to the body, it kind of turns more red. So mouse ears look like they were doing their job. Woke up this morning to a successful print, which is awesome to see. Six hours and 17 minutes is what it took. So that's how long it's gonna to take to print the other side. Let's get to it. And the other side of the neck is done. Let's just cut these mouse ears off. It's hard to do with one hand. I like the translucentness and I'm not feeling any elephant's footing, which is exactly what I need for this very functional print. This is why we make iterations and prototypes. You can see on this first version that I had a separate piece for the fretboard. That's the way that classic luthiers make guitars and ukuleles. For this design, I kept the fretboard integral to the neck, and you can see I've got these slots. They're meant to be dovetails, but with the printing, I don't think they're dovetailed, but you can see the print has kind of got a dovetail to it. But yeah, I'm gonna slide frets in there made of 3D printed plastic, obviously. And yeah, this would work. It's pretty cool, right? Here's the problem. These are the bodies for the tuning machines and they slide in like so. I've got this truss rod. I'm calling it a truss band. It's just gonna get pulled on. And so that sits into the channel in between the two halves of the neck. They go together like so. And now we've got the threaded portion sticking out the back. I notched the print here and this slides into it just like that. And then I can put this knob right on there and as I pull this, it will pull the neck down and that will counteract the tension forces from the strings which are pulling the neck up. So in this way I can get a nice balanced fretboard and everything should be kosher. Mm, here's the problem with that. You see my integrated fretboard right here? It goes over this little bit of geometry that's actually holding the neck into the body of the ukulele. So if I put the neck back together without the truss band in it, I can slide the soundboard front face of the body onto the neck, followed by the back half. That would be an assembled ukulele. But with the truss band in place on the neck, obviously it can't slide all the way through. So the solution is that I need to drop the body from the top here, and so that means I need to carve out this portion of the fretboard. So I'm gonna get this prototype together just to you know prove it out and to, to continue testing it, but yeah, this is, some serious design flaws that I'm gonna to have to address in the next iteration. By the way, I'm doing all of these prints on what I would call a medium format printer, the Ender 3 S1 Plus here. 300 millimeters by 300 millimeters is the bed size, also the same in the, uh, in the Z height. And it's just the right size for a concert ukulele to be printed on. This would not fit on your standard size printer, similar to like the Prusa i3 Mark III here. I've printed these tiny needle sized frets on the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon at a 0.1 millimeter layer height. And you can see I'm just sort of sliding them into place in the dovetails and it seems to be working. We got 
broken glass on the ground from previous cars that have been broken into here, but that's where I'm parking. And you can see the sign right there, McCormick Place. That's where the event is. And it's really not a far walk. Uh, I'll be out of here before dark. So I don't think my car's gonna get broken into and it's $25 just to park right there, one block away. So yeah, I think I'll risk it. I don't know how many of you guys have been to conventions, but it's kind of the same thing every time. <laughs> I've been to the outdoor retailer twice and travel goods, all this for my bag company. But uh, yeah, here at my first technology convention, and it's, uh, I know this dance, let's put it that way. So there's the main entrance, let's go in there. And if you need some directions, you can just use the fancy map here. Let's start our journey at Slice Engineering. Their booth number is 17 something or other, so they're gonna be in that area right there. Hey look, it's just another hot end, except, uh, no. Two thermistors up here at this melt zone, so there's a dual melt zone happening. And that's just redundancy. There's another thermistor down here so that they can double check and make sure that we don't have any problems uh, happening as, you know, with where the filament's exiting the nozzle colder than it is where the thermistor's reading it or something crazy like that. There is a splitter inside here. After it's melted, after the filament's melted from up here, it hits a splitter which um, effectively sort of mixes up the filament and that looks kind of like a CHT nozzle, but the difference is that this technology actually comes from the land of injection molding. Yes, this is doing essentially exactly what happens in injection molding. So in injection molding, they will put a dye into the, the melt path and they have different form factors of dyes depending on exactly what they're trying to make the polymer do. So what this is actually doing is as the polymer melts, if you think of, uh, oh no, I'm on video. <laughs> if you think of uh, like a stream flowing and if you introduce, like if you widen the path of the stream, you get these eddies around the edges, right? So that's what happens when you bring a solid filament into a melt zone where you're suddenly turning it into a liquid. You're getting eddies along the wall. And so putting something at the, once it's completely melted and there's no solid core, putting something towards the end of the melt zone that realigns all those polymer fibers. And this actually works great for like carbon fiber filled stuff or glass filled stuff. Uh, it actually realigns the fibers before it exits the nozzle. And that gives you one higher flow rate, two more laminar flow. And anytime you can introduce a laminar flow regime instead of a turbulent flow regime, you're improving the overall throughput and also laying down cleaner layers uh, at the back end of the, of the nozzle. So. There's a whole white paper. They've got all kinds of write-ups. Check them out on their website, but really amazing stuff coming from Slice Engineering once again. And if you really want to get fancy with it and you need to switch out your nozzles, let's see if I can get this right. Yeah, you push that in and it unlocks it so that these just come on out and then you just sort of click that back in and pull that and you're back locked in. Pretty impressive little machine, you guys. Dual high flow part cooling nozzles for extremely fast printing. And of course, Slightness Engineering's uh, quick change nozzle here, push the button. I can't fully pull it out because there's still filament loaded in the machine. So why would you want a printer like this? Well, what if you're a prototyping shop, it's like an industrial designer who needs to make a customer's product, you've gotta run through the iterations, you're gonna wanna do fast prints. So you get a big nozzle on there, you got the really great part cooling, so you can just bang those out. Get your prototypes made. Once you get to a final version, something you want to show your customer, you do the quick change, you swap out the whole hot end in like three seconds, and you can print with a 0.2 or even a 0.1 millimeter nozzle. The machine moves so fast that that final print is still going to be uh, pretty quick, but it's going to be very finely printed, and you're going to have a nice thing to show your customer. So this is great technology. So looking at their website, it's hard to tell just how many offerings Slice Engineering has, but look, there's their impressive rack. Speaking of impressive racks, we've got all the offerings here from Bontech, and you guys, I just learned about all these, and I can't remember it all. Like, there are so many solutions here. If you've got a 3D printer, they've got something for you. So. Uh, this is basically the, um, what is it, the LGX that I have. Yes. And it's got this heat, you know, transmitting piece of metal that goes around the corner to this heat sink. And that's not super efficient. It does the job, but it could be better. So in answer to that, they came up with a better heat cooling because it's at the front. Now, 
with that there, you now have to mount your part cooling fan out in front yeah, and I things get complicated. So totally yeah, there's trade-offs, but okay, that's uh, really that's cool. Okay, so then we've got the uh, the Bontech, what is this, LGX Pro with a fully steel filament path the entire direction and you know, a better, stronger motor because it's taller uh, or thicker, whatever you want to call it there. So, you know, there's a solution for everything, every little thing, every little tweak you'd want to make into the Bontech LGX Pro uh, light <laughs> on all steel drive train, all steel filament path, that whole nine yards. And hey, you need some serious gearing, you really need to push some filament through something. Look at that beast. <laughs> so cool. You guys, uh, I mean, I know it's not DIY stuff like you and I normally do, but uh, man, these engineers, they're just hard at work. This machine right here goes on to most Creality printers. Everything before the Sprite extruder is my understanding that this will just bolt right onto it. This is the Positron printer by Kralin, the immensely talented designer. He's got a YouTube channel. I'll put the link in the description to his videos about this, but it's been a few years since he made a video, and in that interim, LDO has been working on getting a kit, which they will eventually bring to market, but it's not available yet. For instance, we have parts like this, a custom professionally CNC'd uh, version of a Fadis hot end, which you can see does this right angle turn. There's the nozzle, and that's what you need for this low profile printer, which by the way, came in this Pelican case. The original design was designed to pack down into a uh, filament box, like the cardboard box that your filament comes in. So just amazing stuff. And of course, some of you may already know about this, seen it on Twitter, that is not a glass bed. That is a heated bed. There's a thin film on top here, and we have one like positive and negative electrodes here, and it's conducting the heat across the bed. So I'm touching that, and it is 40 degrees. It feels just like a normally heated bed with the you know traces running back and forth. The um, you know wh however you do it, whether you've got the silicone mat or whether you've got the uh, PCB you know adhered to the underside of your aluminum panel, this is going to function the same way. It's just it's really cool, and of course it is available from that company there in the UK if you guys want to get your hands on that. But still, we have problems. Uh, uh, getting this. So I've got some parts. I could DIY this. I could kind of get it together and follow the build guide. I'm seriously considering it because we don't know when the kit's going to be released by LDO. They keep showing us the prototypes at these shows, but there's no kit available yet. Yes. Keep your fingers crossed. Give them some uh, love over there on the LDO. Link in the description and maybe they'll you know, work a little harder to get this to market quicker. All right. <laughs> and somebody on Twitter was asking me what happens during a print failure. Well, look, we had a layer shift happen here and that's a print failure. It's not a spaghetti monster, but it's not great. And look, it's it's really not causing too many problems. You have this protective plate over all the, uh, the sensitive things on the hot end, on the moving bits. So even if you had a spaghetti mess, uh, I think it's not gonna be too tragic. And it's just so cool how compact it is. It packs down into a Pelican case, you know? Like, what other printer can possibly do that? Fantastic. One of the random connections I just made here at the show was with this Aeon 3D. They're a Canadian company coming out of Montreal, I think. And, you know, we do this consumer level, low cost machine thing hobby all day long. But talking to these guys shows me just how amazing 3D printing can be. Like when you have top level engineers doing the same things that we're doing in like a $20,000 machine, uh, they can achieve just some phenomenal results. And it's all about heat soaking all of the parts that they've been teaching me about. Uh, having multiple print surfaces like um, carbon fiber uh, peak for your, you know, for printing, your, they've got, you know, everything, you, all the different surfaces you need depending on which material you're printing with. We've got semi-crystalline materials versus just the amorphous materials. All this very smart engineering and they can give you a solution if you are a company that you know can afford their printer and just needs a solution that works, that's this. It's not, you know, you and me, we're trying to figure this stuff out and learn and become sort of engineers ourselves, but there are already guys who have figured almost all of these issues out and they're offering solutions if you have the money. Check them out, Aeon 3D. And these guys just taught me something that kind of blew my mind, and that is they don't run part cooling because they're printing in such high, like, engineered plastics that it's this recipe of, what are these, it's like coffee, time, temperature, and pressure, and all that. So uh, they find that they just use support material and they get their feed rate and their you know, flow rate and all that stuff <laughs> dialed in perfectly, and they get isotropic strength characteristics from the semi-crystalline plastics like Peak. So that means they don't have layer adhesion problems like you and I have. They won't even print in PLA because 
they want that. Like, this is, you want to talk about functional prints. That's what these guys are making. It's so smart, you guys. There's so much for us to learn in the hobby. There's literally so much stuff to see here. You couldn't, you couldn't cover it all. You couldn't talk to every booth. And, um, I mean, it's hard because everybody's got their interests. And even though it seems like a show devoted to your interest, you'd be surprised how niche your interests are. Obviously, I don't talk to everybody. And I gotta give a big shout out to Dimension. Thank you guys. They fed me last night, hot dog and a beer, and they're doing some pretty interesting stuff as well. They don't even make a 3D printer. All they do is they focus on the post-processing for the powdered plastics. Like you're talking your SLS or your multi-jet where you spray the powder and then you hit it with a laser. All of those types of prints require some post-processing and these guys make the machines from the media blasting to sort of like polish it, to the vapor smoothing, and even the coloring. They've got a special like, little washing machine kind of a thing that colors it. Well, let's take a look at the uh, airless basketball that they've got on display. It's got an interesting ring to it. I wish I could uh, convey this through the video, but and it, as it hits your hands, you can feel the you can feel the ring. It's really cool. I wish I had one of these. Ah, I missed. You guys, look at the size of that printer behind me. It's so huge. Here's a quarter for scale. That's about a, an inch, right? This thing is so large. Big rep. But oh boy, does it get bigger than that. I think they're printing a boat in there maybe? I don't know, it's huge. And of course this is gonna be pellet extrusion and almost none of the same technology as you and I use on our home printers. But it is FDM extrusion based. They're printing one of these right now and afterwards they're going to mill it down to something like this. Raise 3D. I like this company because they make a crossbar style printer. The crossbar movement system, of course, pioneered by Ultimaker here at the show. You can see, same, same. Two crossbars, gives you the lowest inertial mass in your movement system. I love it. Check out the Hart Douglas Daluge style hammer. Hasn't been hardened yet, but it's made out of metal. Printed on an FDM machine. This is the green core, pretty, pretty fragile. 95% metal and 5% binder. You send this off and they, I think it's called debrindle it? <laughs> they get the, uh, the plastic out and they turn it into 100% metal like that. And here's the hot end. It's just replaceable. You just sort of pinch it together and it slides right out. And they got an abrasive core. So good stuff here at the Ultimaker booth. Hey, look everyone. I'm walking past the Prusa booth and nobody's getting hurt. How strange. This is some cool stuff, you guys. It's a material that was developed at the military lab. It's similar to a solder, but it's not a solder. You can see it's, it's fairly flexible, and it's able to be uh, extruded in a process similar to FDM. So using an IDEX machine, we're 3D printing the blue base plastic and then putting some 100% metal down on top of it, which you're able to then solder electronics to. It's pretty interesting. Here's the card if anybody wants to reach out. Get a prototype or start to work with this. Here we have it, the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon Killer. This machine is awesome, you guys. 300 millimeter print volume, which means I can print one of my ukuleles on this right here. And yeah, look at how fast it's printing. They say they're beating Bamboo Lab times and it's gonna be uh, fully, basically an integrated sonic pad. You can put your prints on it through the thumb drive or through the cloud. Now they are doing that stupid cloud thing just like Bamboo that I don't like so much. But they are an open source company. Creality does release their files. And of course, just like everything else, any old filament will work. So they're not too proprietary. Uh, and this looks like a really great machine, large format. I can't wait to get my hands on this one. I have to have it. This is apparently a sister company to Creality and it's a pellet based printer. So you put your pellets there, three kilograms of pellets. They feed down through there. We get lots of lots of, uh, of print volume. And here's some of the media. So it's gonna be a lot cheaper than buying filament. And look at how big you can print. Another printer I really, really want. So here's the finished ukulele printed on the Ender 3 S1 Plus. And what better way to introduce it than sitting here at the Creality booth at the Rapid Plus DCT show. Now, you guys might recognize the form factor. It's the same body outline as I came up with in the previous video, link in the description, by the way. So inspired by actual female curves, that's the neckline of a ballerina. 
and yeah, improvements that I made. The, uh, the machines, the tuning machines here, are now have their own sort of encasing so that the layer lines don't split apart before when I tried to integrate that into the headstock, I was getting layer separation issues. So this avoids that. So it is extremely playable. In fact, it's one of the most playable ukuleles that I own. Uh, it sounds a little tinny, and more to, kind of like a banjo because the PLA, it's just straight PLA, it doesn't have any additives, so the the, uh, the mass of it isn't quite there to give it a more bassy sound, but it, it's not too bad. I mean, it's a ukulele, these aren't Stradivarius violins or anything like that. So, yeah, I like it. All right, well, that was the Rapid Show, Rapid and TCT, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. I love you guys, you're the reason I keep making videos. Have a great day, see you in the next one, bye. Just when you think you're special because you made a 3D printed ukulele, you meet Alfred with a professional level cello. This thing is incredible. We've got uh, carbon fiber flat plates front and back, 3D printed in the middle, and Yo-Yo Ma has one of these, right? Or he's got uh, one on he order. ordered one. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is so cool. And listen to the sound of this thing, guys.